In this powerful sermon, Pastor Timothy R. Carter draws a parallel between the struggles of King David and those experienced by modern Christian followers. By weaving historical and scriptural accounts with practical, real-world examples, he encourages listeners to trust and obey God's word, especially when facing family and personal difficulties. He emphasizes the importance of Christian unity and love as critical testimonies to belonging to Jesus Christ. Praise him because he is worthy to be praised. Yes, he is. We're on the winning side. Yes. We will one day be with him. Yes. He loves us and he will never forsake us. Amen. So let's keep our eyes focused on him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord, your presence is sweet in this place this morning. Lord, we can feel your tangible presence and we praise you for being here. We thank you because you are in our midst and we know through your word that you inhabit the praise of your people. Mm. Holy God, you are worthy to be praised. Lord, you are worthy to be praised. Holy God, thank you for being with us. Teach us how to worship you more completely. Teach us how to give you genuine praise. Help us, Lord, to lift you up in all circumstances. To look to you and see your hand at work. Praise you, praise you, praise you, Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Holy God, we praise you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We're on the winning side. Amen. God's word tells us that we're going to win. But God's word has also told us we've already won. Amen. Through him, we're not only those who have victory, but we are more than conquerors. Yeah. Because he has already won. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Glory. The enemy comes to seek, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus has already provided life eternal. In him, we already have that eternal life. Amen. I heard one preacher put it this way. If you're saved, you're as sure as for heaven as if you're already there. I really like that, don't you? But it's not something that we're hoping for in a way of like we put a wish upon a star. But we're not wishing on a star and we're not trying to rub a little genie lamp like Aladdin and hoping that something positive might happen. But rather we're putting our hope in a Savior that has already conquered death. He has already conquered hell and he has already conquered the grave and he shares that with us. Oh, hallelujah. We have life in him. And our life with him is forever and ever. Amen. You ever truly think about the gifts that we have in him? It's exciting. What do we owe him? Simply our obedience. Amen. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if you truly love him, you will keep his word. How can we keep his word unless we study his word? How can we keep his word if we don't know his word? We need to keep his word. Often we see Christians that claim to be Christian, but yet they live in blatant disobedience to God's word. How can those people truly call themselves children of God? It's puzzling to me. Because he is a God of love. And if you belong to him, you will love him. If you belong to him, you will love his people. If you belong to him, you will have his character drawing you to be more like him. Now, please understand, I'm not saying that every Christian is perfect. Obviously, God is perfect. But not every Christian is perfect. All Christians still make mistakes. All Christians still have the temptations of sin. Some Christians even practice sin on a regular basis. But 
There is something inside of the believer pulling them back to that road of correction, pulling them back to the character of God. Amen. Today, we're going to look at two individuals who show these two different sides. Yesterday was Veterans Day. And we have some veterans right here among us. So remember to thank God for our veterans. Remember to thank God for the freedom that we have. The freedom we have in this country because of veterans who have gone and fought and served our country. And in doing so, they serve us. We have freedom because of that. But also, thank God because of the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. Because he has won the ultimate war. Yes. Locate, please. 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Those of you who were in my Sunday school class, we've studied this recently in Sunday school. And in doing so, we made a comparison between David and, Saul, and King Saul. We're going to try to take a closer look at that today. Excuse me. 1 Samuel what? Chapter 30. Thank you. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Let's begin reading in verse 1. Now it happened... When David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who are and those who were there from small to great they did not kill anyone but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were there with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Now that's some heavy grief, isn't it? They weeped until they had no more strength left to weep. Have you ever been so sad you felt like your world was coming to an end? Have you ever cried so much that you had no tears left? Have you ever grieved so hard that you felt like your heart fell out of your body? This is what David and his men were experiencing. Because their families had been taken. Their homes had been burned. Their entire city burned to the ground. Their wives, their sons, and their daughters were taken captive. Could you imagine what that would be like? You, as a man, you go off to war. You go to serve in a war. And when you come back, that the enemy has taken your family. What were the women going through who had been captive? What were the children going through? What imaginations would be going through your head? What is my family suffering right now? This is the grief that David and his men were experiencing. Well, what did they do? How did they get in this situation in the first place? Let's back up for a few chapters. Who are the Amalekites? The Amalekites... This is the army that's led by Agag. You remember? Haman and Esther, Haman the Agagite. This is the same army, the same family group. Agag is the one that attacked Israel just after they left Egypt. Agag and his army came in to attack Israel. When Saul became king, God told Saul, go into battle and kill them all. Kill all. I know some people have a problem with that, saying that the God of the Old Testament is a God of meanness to kill everybody. But it's war. They're in war, and people die during war. God told Saul to go kill everybody. Saul later comes to Samuel and says, Hey, brother, praise God. Guess what? 
I did everything God told me to do. Samuel, the prophet, said, God told you to kill all of the animals. He said, I did. He said, then why do I hear the animals? He said, oh, I killed them all except for those few. The, my men made me take them because we're going to offer them up in sacrifice to God. That's not what God told him to do. He said, God told you to kill every human. He said, oh, I did. I killed everybody. He said, you have Agag right there. You didn't kill Agag. He said, oh, I killed them all except him. So Samuel pulls his sword and kills Agag, hacked him to pieces. When he hacked him to pieces, Agag, of course, was dead. But there were others who still lived. We know that because here there are men who came and attacked David's city. These men come to attack David's city. Now, of course, we know David's in Ziglag because he's running and hiding from Saul. Saul didn't want to kill the man and kill the people that God told him to kill. But Saul has been chasing David to kill David because God chose David. Samuel told Saul, God has taken the kingdom out of your hand and has given it to your neighbor, who is David. Because you lived in disobedience, because you refused to obey the word of God, God has taken away from you and has given it to David. Some Christians live like Saul. Some Christians live, they claim, look, I did what I want to do, and I'm going to praise God because I did what I want to do. We as Christians don't need to try to live like Saul, but rather we need to live in alignment with God's word. We ought to do what God's word tells us to do. We need to obey God's word because if not, we will suffer the persecution. If not, we will suffer the repercussions of our actions. Just as Saul suffered what he didn't do. He disobeyed God. He did things his way and it caused trouble for the entire nation. If you don't obey God, not only are you causing trouble for yourself, you are causing trouble for your family. If you don't obey God, you are causing trouble for your neighbors. If you don't obey God, you are causing trouble for other people. You know why? Because God knows best and you don't. Amen. I don't know best. He does. Amen. So what we ought to do is obey God. Even when we don't understand, we ought to obey God. Even when we don't understand what's happening, we ought to obey God. Even when we are confused, we ought to obey God. Even when things don't make sense, we ought to obey God. Amen. David ran from Saul. He went over to the Philistine king. Remember, the Philistines are making war against Israel. And Saul runs. He asks God for help, and God doesn't answer him. So he runs to a witch to seek counsel. Is that a good idea? No. Would it be a good idea to go ask a witch for guidance? <laughs> That's straight-up foolishness, right? So Saul runs to the witch and ask her for guidance. Samuel shows up. Samuel's already dead. But Samuel shows up and tells Saul, because of what you've done, now you're going to die. If you pursue the ways of the devil, you're bringing death on yourself. If you pursue an avenue other than God's will, you're bringing death on yourself. Because Jesus is life, and he is life everlasting. Anything outside of Jesus is death. The only way we can have genuine and true life is in him. So always turn and cling to Jesus. So David spends a year and four months in this foreign country pretending to serve this king. And while doing so, He's, a, he's fighting his enemies, but he tricks the king and makes the king think he's fighting the king's battle. But David is really 
weeding out his enemies so that when he gets on the throne, most of his enemies are destroyed. So the king decides, we're going to go into battle against Israel. And David, because you and your 600 men, because you've been so faithful to me, I want you right by my side. David tells him, I'm with you. David knows they're going to battle against Israel. I really don't know if David would have fought Israel or not. We don't know. It's only speculation. He never made it to that battle. David and his men go up for battle, but the king's advisors, they said, hold on, no way. That's David. Our enemy that we're going to fight against, they sing praise songs about that man. Remember, O king, they, of him, they say Saul killed a thousand and David killed ten thousand. You heard them chanting that song on the battlefield. That's the man they're singing about. I'm not going to go fight with him by my side. He's our enemy. So the king, listening to his advisors, tells David, no, you can't go to war with us. So you take your army and go back home. So David and his army... After marching for three days to get there, they march back home for three days. That's six days on the road. These men are tired. After a six-day march, wouldn't you be ready to go home and go to bed? Wouldn't you want to embrace your wife and play with your kids? So these men are looking forward to their families. But when they get there, their homes are destroyed. Their entire city is burned to the ground. Their families are kidnapped. So they grieve. Because the enemy has stolen. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like the enemy has come in to destroy your life? Amen. The enemy has come in to destroy your home. To flatten your hopes. To destroy life away your dreams. To rip hope right out of your heart. Have you ever felt like the enemy has come in to kill to rob and to destroy you. Today I believe we ought to hear from God. Because God is telling us something special. We can take a lesson from the life of David. To hear what God has to say. David was weeping. And he sat. His men, as you remember, his 600 men. They're misfits and rejects. He built his army off of the guys that nobody else wanted. They're the rejects that nobody else wanted, but they cling to David because he treats them with equal humanity. So they cling to David because they see that element of humanity in him. They see something special, that anointing of God coming from David, and they're attracted to him. So David is with his men as they are weeping and crying. They cry so hard their strength leave them, leaves them. They turn on David and they're going to stone him. They got to blame somebody. You ever felt so tired of life that you lash out against people? In your logic, you know it's not really his fault. You know it's not his fault, but you just lash out at him. Or you speak harsh words to your wife when you know she didn't do anything wrong, but your attitude just finds her as your target. That's what these men are doing. They know it's not really David's fault, but they're attacking him. They're ready to stone him because they want to blame somebody. Does David fight back? David could have easily have started fighting with his men. He could have drawn his sword and start saying, okay, you guys want to fight me? You want to stone me? You may kill me, but I'm going to take a few of you out as you do, so come on. He could have done that, but he didn't. What did he do? Sometimes Christians take that attitude, don't they? Sometimes they say, you want to fight? Come on, I'll fight you. You want red carpet in the church? We don't need red carpet. We need green carpet. Come on, let's fight over it. You, you want to sing 
a song, Amazing Grace. We sing that every Sunday. I'm tired of that song. Let's sing me this other song. And they're ready to fight. Sometimes Christians bicker among themselves. But we don't need that attitude. We need to have unity. We ought to have unity in the church. We need to have unity among the believers. It was that character of unity, that character of Christ's love among us, that is what will testify that we belong to him. It's the love that we have for one another that will tell this world that we belong to Jesus. It's that love that will testify there is something different about us. Even the sinners can take care of their families. Even the sinners can choose to do good humanitarian things. Even the sinners can do positive things for this world. But only the Christian can live and walk by the love of Christ. Only the Christian can allow the love of Christ to radiate through them. So this is our goal. We need to strive to let the love of Jesus flow through us. We ought to be characterized by the love of Jesus. What it ought to be said of us, out of all the things that people say, what ought to be said of us is that we are people of love. We are people of genuine Christ-like love. Yes. Can that truly be said of you? Can that truly be said of me? We ought to strive to have more love, shouldn't we? Yes. One of the ways that we have more love is to do what David did. What did David do? When his men are ready to kill him, David doesn't fight back. David asks the priest, Hey, priest, remember all the priests got killed by Saul. There was one priest that escaped. Saul killed all of God's priests. One priest escaped. David turns to this one priest that escaped Saul's wrath. And David asked his priest to help him call on the Lord. So David asked for the ephod, which is part of the garment of the priest. And there David Call on God and ask God, what should I do? This is what a true Christian ought to do. When we face difficulty, when we know that the enemy has come to destroy us, we need to turn to God and say, God, what should I do? We don't need to get on Google searching for the answer first. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But that shouldn't be our first move. Our first move should be getting before God and saying, God, what do you want me to do? We don't need to turn to psychologists for the answers. We need to turn to God for the answer. We need to turn to God for the answer. Amen. We need to do what David did and say, God, I call on you. What do you want me to do during this time? Do you want me to go to battle against these enemies? God answered him. Did you know that if you pray, God will answer? God will hear your prayer. So David heard from God and God said to him, Yes, you need to rise up, go against this enemy, and you will overtake them. And you will win. So I believe that's what God is telling us this morning. When we recognize the enemy has come against Mount Olive Church of God, we need to hear the voice of God telling us, Rise up and stand against the enemy. You will overtake the enemy because Jesus has already won. Get ready for battle because Jesus has already won. Rise up and go take back what the enemy has stolen. Go and get your family because the enemy has stolen them. But God says you can claim them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. David's family was kidnapped. Has the enemy come to kidnap your family? Has the enemy come to take your children away from you? Are your children trapped in the bondage of sin? Are your loved ones on their way to hell? You can claim them today 
Call out to God and say, God, the enemies come against my wife. The enemies come against my husband. The enemies come for my, my son. The enemy has come for my daughter. What do you want me to do? I believe God will tell you, go and get your family. You will overcome the enemy. Amen. He wants your children to be part of the Christian family more than you want them to be. So turn to God and fight with his strength. <clears throat> Lean on him and go into victory on the word of the Lord. Go into victory on the word of the Lord. When you obey God's word, you will always have the promises of God on your side. When you have God on your side, who can stand against you? Who can defeat you when God is on your side? When you stand on God's word, who can take away your foundation? When you stand on the promises of God, who can take away your hope? When you stand on the promises of God, who can rob you of your victory? Because your victory is not in your circumstances. Your victory is in the cross. Your victory is in the cross. Your victory is in the cross. There is nothing on this earth. There is nothing above this earth. There is nothing beneath this earth that can remove you from the hand of God. Amen. Your victory is in the cross of Jesus Christ. So stand on the promises of God. His promise to David. And I believe that promise is still true today. That you should rise up and go against the enemy. Because God has already won the battle. Amen. Amen. Yes. So David and his men. Only 400 of them. 200 were too weak to go into battle. So David takes only 400 men with him into battle. He goes against the enemy, and that enemy is so large, the Bible says, that, that, that they are spread all across the land, enjoying their spoils, and they are celebrating and dancing. David attacks them, and the battle takes place all night and all day. How many hours he's had in battle? That's a long time. David and 400 of his men attack the enemy and they fight. He kills everybody except for 400 men, 400 Amalekites who escape by camel. The army's so large, he kills everybody except only 400. That's a large army. It's only 400 that escape. That's the size of David's army. He goes in with 400 men, including himself, that's 401 men. David didn't lose any soldiers, but he defeats the enemy, and the rest run scared. Why? Because David inquired of the Lord. He accepted God at his word. And he moved forward. Mm -hmm. This is what we ought to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We need to call on God. When you feel like the enemy has come in to destroy your family, <clears throat> call on God and say, God, what do you want from me? God, what do you want me to do? Lord, I am here. I am your humble servant. Show me the way. Matter of fact, join with me in prayer. Let's all join in prayer right now. And let's pray asking God to show us what he wants from us. Let's each one call on God and ask him, what do you want from me? What should I do in this situation? Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to come before you. Lord, we know that the enemy comes in like a flood, but you will rise up a standard against him. We know that the enemy comes to rob, but you are our protector. 
We know that the enemy comes to destroy, but in you we have life. We know that the enemy seeks to destroy us and take away our families, but we know that we have victory in you. Show us what you want us to do. How do we rise up in your name? How do we stand firm on your word? How do we march in your victory? Speak to our hearts and show us how to claim the victory we have only in you. Amen. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name, Lord. Thank you. Thank you.